Well, good morning and welcome to Fizz, Fun Interactive Sunday School. And whether you use this as your Sunday school because you're not yet able to return to church because of the virus, or whether you use this to supplement your other Bible studies uh, or prepare you for Bible study at your church that's studying the same Life and Work series, uh, we're glad that you're with us today. And there's still two questions that I'd like to ask you. Number one, what about the beard? Does it go or does it stay? <laughs> The second question is, I've been starting a new format which starts out pretty much at the beginning of the session with 10 questions. Would you like to have those 10 questions in advance of your study of the lesson? And if you would, I can put it on the YouTube channel so that you can go to the YouTube channel and get those 10 questions the Friday before the Sunday lesson. Uh, if that's something that you'd like to have, please drop me a note at Pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, P like Peter, S like Sims, or Sam, and V like Victor, the number seven at gmail.com. That's Pastor, P-S-V, seven at gmail.com. Those initials are Peter, Sims, Vandeway, or P-S-V. Uh, and I uh, would love to have your comments on anything I can do to make this a more meaningful time. Uh, for you to be able to study the Word of God. And so I'd love to hear your comments about the beard and also about whether you'd like to have the questions in advance of the lesson. Today we're in the Gospel of Luke and we'll continue through this whole quarter in the Gospel of Luke, written approximately A.D. 62 to 64. However, the event uh, that takes place here is approximately A.D. 29 in the winter months and uh, we uh, know that uh, we have just gone through the Galilean ministry of Jesus, about 55 events. And so we're going to be looking at where Jesus is now. And, of course, the event that he talks about uh, is in Jerusalem. Uh, and, uh, and we're with the travelers going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, it's a very famous uh, parable of Jesus that he tells uh, as a result of a question that's posed to him. And I think you'll enjoy studying this particular one and seeing some new insights into it. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is uh, 25,640 words, which is more than any of the other Gospels. It's considered one of the three synoptic Gospels, which means there are parallel passages that the same events are told in at least one other Gospel. There's 125 to 150 events covered in Luke, and those were done by eyewitnesses, Luke tells us at the very beginning of his writing. And he wants us to know what we believe and why we believe it. And he certainly has made that clear in the beginning of his gospel. And he's the only Gentile writer, and he's not one of the apostles uh, that Jesus called, not one of the 12. And uh, so we see that he is writing to a Greek mindset, if you will, a uh, very uh, appropriate, trying to think, keep things in consecutive order. Uh, as a doctor would be detailed, he is trying to be detailed and make sure that all of his witnesses are good witnesses and that this is an accurate account of Christ's life. Today's particular passage of scripture found in Luke chapter 10 beginning at verse 25, uh, is one that has no parallel passages to it. Uh, that is, the same event is not told in any of the other gospel accounts. So uh, we have uh, n nowhere to look for our information except this particular passage of Scripture. However, our lesson writer today encourages you to read all of chapter 10, uh, as you hopefully are reading all of the Gospel of Luke as we go through them, even though we're just picking certain events out of the chapters, uh, it's a good way to study the gospel and to keep things in context. Jesus has been healing, he's been teaching, he's been preaching, he's been traveling all around the Sea of Galilee. His base seems to be Capernaum, and uh, he's certainly starting to build some notoriety about himself. But as we begin today's lesson, we see the first of the opposition the strong opposition uh, against Jesus. And uh, certainly uh, we know that he felt lots of opposition towards the very end. 
so much so that they wanted to kill him. But today we just see a, a request, a question, and uh, we're going to take a look at the scriptures today. But I thought first I'd give you the 10 questions that you should look for the answers for. And so you can stop and start this video and uh, that way you can jot down these questions in abbreviated form, answer them in abbreviated form after you've studied the scriptures, and then I'll review the answers to the questions as we pull apart the scripture. Question number one, where was Jesus for this event? Where was Jesus physically for this event? Question number two, was Jesus, what was Jesus likely to have been doing when this event occurred? What was Jesus likely to have been doing when he uh, was involved in this event? Number three, who asked Jesus a question? Who asked Jesus a question? Question number four, Compare Matthew 12:10, which happens to be the parallel passage for Luke 6:7. Compare Luke 6:10, excuse me, 6:7 and Matthew 12:10 against today's question in chapter 10, verse 25. Compare Matthew 12:10 with Luke 10:25. What is the difference? What is the difference? between those two sections. Question number five. What three errors did the lawyer make asking Jesus the question? What errors were in his question? Three errors in his question. That's question number five. Question number six. Why does it say down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Why does it say down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Question number seven. Who were Samaritans? What were they? Who were Samaritans? What were they? Question number eight. What three things did the Samaritan provide for the person who had been robbed. What three things did the Samaritan provide? I don't mean individual items like the wine or clothing, uh, but what three things, characteristics of the Samaritans did he give to the uh, man who had been robbed? What three things? Number nine, what is the value today of two denarii. What is the value today of two denarii? Question number 10. Do you think the lawyer understood why Jesus told the parable? And did it change the lawyer's opinion of Jesus? What do you think the lawyer did? Did he understand what Jesus told and why he told the parable, and did it change the way the lawyer was thinking? Yeah, it's kind of a trick question. Uh, extra credit, very complicated extra credit. Lots of lots of opportunities for extra credit here. Why didn't Jesus just answer the lawyer's question? Why didn't Jesus just answer the lawyer's question? Well, you have to believe in me in order to have eternal life. Why didn't he just answer it that way? Why did he ask two questions of the lawyer instead of answering that question? What is a parable? That's B. <laughs> a was, why didn't he answer the question directly? B is, what is a parable? C. How many parables did Jesus use in his ministry that are recorded in the Bible? How many parables did Jesus use in the gospel accounts? Uh, how many did he use? What did the lawyer use as an Old Testament passage 
to answer Jesus' question. What scriptures did the lawyer use in order to answer Jesus' question back to him? That was D. And finally, the most important question you should always ask yourself after any lesson or any reading of Scripture is, what's God trying to say to me? What is God trying to say to me? How does he want me to apply this to my life? We can become Bible scholars, but if we don't look at application to our lives, we've missed the whole point of why God gave us a Bible. So let's take a look and stop the video at this point if you want. Uh, go back through the questions, slowly stop and starting the video as you want to, uh, and uh, answer the questions in abbreviated form. You're not going to turn them into anybody, so you can just abbreviate your answers. Or you may just want to mentally keep them in your mind, but answer these 10 questions. And the extra credit uh, questions, there's uh, four of those. And uh, then we'll take and pull apart the scriptures together and we'll answer all of those questions for you. I hope you've stopped and started the uh, video so that you could answer those questions and research those in your reading of uh, chapter 10 uh, of the Gospel of Luke. And I hope that uh, you're ready now to pull apart the scripture so that you can see the answers to those questions. And I hope that you've made a mental note to let me know whether or not you'd like to have those questions in advance available up on YouTube as uh, 10 questions for the coming Sunday's lesson. They would be posted by Friday if you write and tell me uh, by my email address. I'll be glad to post those on Friday prior to the lesson if that would make it easier for you to uh, go ahead and, and do these. I could... Uh, post them not only in video, but I could also put a document uh, uh, up someplace for you if you'd rather have the questions printed out uh, so that you could answer them on a piece of paper. I can uh, make sure that I email you the 10 questions uh, or uh, provide them in a word uh, processing uh, format, either PDF or in Microsoft Word. But uh, let me know if you'd like to have those questions in advance of the lesson. Uh, so that you really have time to study the lesson and research it. So let's take a look at today's lesson, which is titled Neighbors. And uh, the title of the lesson, Neighbors, is probably a misnomer a little bit. Um, we really want to know who is your neighbor, as the lawyer wanted to know from Jesus. But it also deals with salvation. How do we get salvation? Uh, and uh, that's obviously what uh, the lawyer wanted to know, uh, even though uh, he has some idea what the law says. So let's take a look at today's lesson, uh, beginning in chapter 10, uh, verse 25. We'll read it in full context, and then we'll pull it apart. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength, with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the robbers, and they stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was a, on a journey, came upon him 
and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him, bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, then when I return I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. In context, we know that Jesus has trained not only his 12, but at least 70 others to a place where he felt he could send them out for on-the-job training to go out and minister and to go out and preach the word. And here in approximately A.D. 29, probably the winter months, Jesus is about halfway through his ministry. He had only three years as an adult to do his ministry. And here we are halfway through, but he has equipped not only his 12, but at least 70 others. And now he has asked the question. Let's take and pull this apart. See if we can answer our 10 questions and our extra credit questions. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, the first question was, where was Jesus for this event? We find in chapter 9, verse 51, that he was on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, he had his eyes set on Jerusalem, but we don't know exactly where he was, whether he had already come out of the region of Galilee, whether he was in Samaria, or exactly where he was. It doesn't tell us. And so in context of chapter 9 and 10, we really don't know exactly where he was. We might try to guess based on other Gospels, but it'd be pretty hard to tell exactly where he was. The second question was, what was he doing in this event? Well, we don't know if he was in a synagogue or whether he was in a home somewhere, but he was definitely teaching. Jesus was teaching every time he had an opportunity about the gospel, about the kingdom of God, and about how we can become, uh, e find eternal life through him. If we read on a little further in Luke, we find that uh, he was in Berea, uh, excuse me, in Bethany, uh, in Bethany, and uh, where Mary and Martha were. But, however, we don't know how much time elapsed between these words and uh, verse 38. Uh, so we can't be certain, but it's likely he was in Judea, uh, Perea perhaps, but uh, probably out of Galilee by this time. In a synagogue or in a house, still can't tell you that. There's a lot in this verse because we ask the next question, which who asked the question? And the answer is a lawyer. He was likely a Levite, maybe a scribe, but he was an expert in the law of Moses, which was really also the law of God. And he had studied those carefully. Probably had also studied all of the traditions uh, that had embellished out of the law. Uh, but we also asked you the question, uh, if you compare this with Matthew 12:10, which is a parallel passage to Luke 6, which we've already studied, and look at this passage, what's the difference between the two passages? Well, I thought that was very interesting because, you see, when we looked at Luke chapter 6, verse 7, and then considered the parallel passage of Matthew 12:10 we see that uh, the, the motive behind the questioning and the passages we've studied prior to this were to try to trick Jesus, try to trip him up, uh, try to capture uh, some kind of falsehood that he would lay down. Uh, in this particular passage, and looking back at the original languages and looking at all of the gospel uh, accounts, it's interesting, the word test him is to see if he was telling the truth, to test him to see how much he knew the law, and to see how much he understood. Uh, so 
what we don't want to be guilty of what we see so often in scripture which is hypocrisy of judging people before we know the facts and so we don't know the facts about this particular lawyer that stood up was he sincerely interested in knowing uh, whether or not jesus could clearly define the way to salvation or was he just trying to trick jesus into saying something that wasn't right that he could correct him based on his knowledge of the law so let's not prejudge him let's consider the fact that he may well have answered asked this question in a sincere way uh, in order to find out just how much jesus knew about eternal life and about the law i asked a fifth question that uh, was also covered actually in this same one verse and that is what were the three errors the lawyer made when he asked the question of jesus <laughs> you, you may have wondered what kind of errors did he make asking a question well first of all he addressed jesus as teacher and jesus was so much more than a teacher uh, to just think that jesus was a good teacher would be a real mistake he, he didn't uh, think that he was the messiah he certainly didn't recognize him as the Messiah or even a prophet, but just addressed him as a teacher. The second mistake that he made, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the obvious answer is that you can't. There's nothing you can do. Uh, as a matter of fact, Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 3 tells us that there's none righteous, no, not one. And we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we know that uh, there's nothing that we can do. We can't work our way into heaven. It's only by grace of God and the faith of man that Jesus died for our sins that we find that we can have eternal life. But that leads us into the third thing. And he, he used the word inherit eternal life. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, uh, I went out on a canvassing assignment years and years ago as a, uh, a student of Campus Crusade for Christ, asking people if they were Christians, and almost all of them said they were. Uh, however, when we got to the second question, which is, what basis are you a Christian? What makes you a Christian? You wouldn't believe the answers we got. Uh, my father was a preacher. I was born in America. Uh, I go to church. We got all kinds of answers other than the right answer. And that would be that they had a personal relationship with Christ and had accepted him as savior, repented of their sins and invited Christ into their lives. And so we see that there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. Uh, because I am a Christian doesn't mean that my son or my daughter are Christians. They had to make that decision for themselves. It's not an inheritance. It doesn't matter if you were born a Jew or whether you were born a Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you were born in America or whether your parents were Christians. You must decide if you're going to follow Christ, which is exactly what the word Christian means, a follower of Christ. And in order to do that, you have to repent of your sins and to receive him as your savior. So don't confuse the fact that he said inherit because you can't inherit it. So there were three mistakes that he made just in his question. And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Well, we answer one of the extra credit questions here, and that is where did the answer that the lawyer gave come from? And of course, it's from the Old Testament, likely a combination of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. And I say that again for you so you can look them up if you'd like to. Uh, likely from Deuteronomy 6, 5, and from Leviticus 19, 15. Uh, it's covered also in a number of other Old Testament passages, but predominantly in Deuteronomy chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 27. 
And the principle is also taught extensively in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus himself said that the law could be summed up with the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Let me give you again, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said upon these two great commandments, rest all of the law and the prophets. And Paul certainly taught it in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul recognized the importance uh, for being obedient to God, to love your neighbors, and taught it very extensively, as you can see from those two references. James also taught the fulfillment of the law was in loving your neighbor, and that's James 2.8. But I want you to think about that for a minute. I want you to think about the fact that if you really love God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength, if you really love him, then you're going to love your neighbor. You're going to have the heart and the mind of God. And the heart of the mind in God is compassion, concern for others, meeting others' needs. Remember last week we studied, take up your cross and follow me. I think it's very important for us to remember that part of taking up that cross is to love our neighbors. And part of the following him is in the fact that we need to follow his standards and his ways. And certainly loving our neighbor is part of that. Now Jesus was not saying that you get eternal life through works of honoring or working or serving your neighbor. Uh, but he was hoping that when he told the parable, which is yet to be read, uh, that he would see that keeping the law was impossible, that there's no way we could love God that fully and no way that we could love our neighbor as ourselves and that we would always fall short by trying to follow the law. But when he asked the lawyer the two questions, he says, what does the law say, and how do you interpret that? What does it mean to you? Uh, he was forcing the lawyer to think. Does the law really say how we can have eternal life? Or does the law just point out the fact that we can't have eternal life by works? We can't be good enough to deserve eternal life. No, there's none righteous, not one. And we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans makes that very clear. And Jesus was hoping through the parable and through bringing this lawyer to a point of examining the law for the answers to eternal life, that he would find that the law doesn't have the answer. The law is not the answer and works are not the answer. And yet even today in America, most people believe that it's works that it's by what you do that you get eternal life instead of what God did and what you have to believe. Now came the lawyer's next question, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? It would be nice if we could limit the definition of who our neighbor is. And uh, perhaps the uh, lawyer was already thinking about all of the things he had done or not done for people that uh, were not Jewish. Uh, but nevertheless, he wanted to try to reframe from thinking that neighbor was everybody. And he uh, wanted Jesus to define what a neighbor was. Well, uh, I think it would be the same way for us today. We'd like to think that our neighbor is just other Christians that go to our church. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not true. Some of our neighbors may be Muslims. Some of our neighbors may be liberals that have a totally different view of what morality and ethics are. And uh, it would be nice if we could eliminate them from considering them as our neighbors that we're supposed to love and we're supposed to care about. But Jesus told a parable. And he told a parable so that this lawyer might better understand who his neighbor was. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Looking at our map, as we usually would look at a map, uh, starting at the top, we see uh, an area that's around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River coming down to the Dead Sea. We have at the top Galilee, Samaria, and then Judea. And if you look uh, just about halfway down, well, no, a third of the way down on the Dead Sea and off to the left, you'll see Jerusalem. And then you see up to the right, Jericho. And you'd say, well, that's not down to, because we normally think about maps being up and down. Uh, but that would be to the northeast of Jerusalem. So why did he say down from Jerusalem to uh, Jericho? And the answer is found very simply in the fact that the geography of the area, Jerusalem is at 2,500 plus feet, and the uh, town of Jericho is some 860 feet below sea level. So we have a drop off or down uh, hill, if you will, from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, of a substantial amount of feet, over 3,000 feet, uh, giving us a very steep, treacherous road going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you can better understand uh, that this would have been like going down the side of a mountain uh, in many places and probably lots of rocks and places where robbers could hide. So knowing the geography of the area and understanding that it's not down as we think about looking at maps where it would be below Jerusalem on a map, it's above Jerusalem on the map but to the northeast and it is downhill all the way <laughs> because of the difference in altitudes. But a Samaritan who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him, and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Now the distance was only about 15 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho as a crow flies, but uh, nevertheless it was a treacherous route and it was very steep, I'm sure, in many places. So we can certainly answer question number six, and that's why it says down from. And uh, we uh, certainly have another question here. and. That is the Samaritan. Samaritans were a mixed breed. That is, they were Jews who had intermarried with Gentiles. Likely most of that occurred during their captivity in Babylon. And once that started, it became quite easy then uh, for there to continue to be intermarriage between Jew and Gentile, uh, particularly between Samaritan and Gentile and Samaritan and Jew. Uh, even today, the Jewish folks believe that uh, they should not intermarry. And many times you will find a break in family relationships because a Jewish girl or boy wants to marry a Gentile boy or girl. And that child uh, that they want to marry is not willing to convert to Judaism. And so we see that uh, Back in Jesus' day, that was a really significant problem. They were considered half-breeds. They were considered unclean. Uh, they were not thought of fondly of at all. And uh, we certainly can understand uh, that there's a stark contrast then between Jewish leaders, priests, and also uh, Levites who saw but ignored this man that had felt among, uh, fell among robbers versus a Samaritan who was not considered anywhere near on the level of a Jew would take the time to go and minister to this man. Well, we've answered question six. Down was elevation from Jerusalem over 2,000 feet above sea level to minus 860 feet below sea level to Jericho. We've talked about who Samaritans are 
And then what were the three things that the Samaritan did? Well, I don't mean uh, in general and specific terms, but in general terms, what we would say is a good Christian that goes to church. He gives of his time, his talent, and his tithe. Well, that's exactly what the Samaritan did here. He gave of his time. He was on a journey. He had a, he had a specific place he was going to. And he took out of that time that where he was supposed to be going for an appointment uh, to look after this particular fellow that fell, fell into amongst the robbers. He also took his talent. Uh, he had some knowledge about how to bind wounds and what to pour on the wounds to treat this man. So he used his talent. And then uh, he took out the denarii in order to provide for his future care as well as the care that he'd already gotten. And uh, he uh, gave his talents, uh, he gave his time, but he also gave his tithe. Well, in this case, he gave his money in order to meet the needs of the Samaritan, his neighbor. Uh, but I think it's really incredibly interesting to take a look at last week's lesson and take a look and see if this Samaritan practiced what Jesus said. What did he say? He said, deny yourself. So he stopped. He took care of this man. He denied his own plans for the day and traveling where he was going. He put these, some, this uh, man that had come amongst the robbers onto his own beast of burden and he denied himself. And he then not only gave his tithe, but prepared for this man's future. He took up his cross. And his cross was to love the Lord God with all of his heart and all of his mind and all of his strength and all of his soul. Uh, and to love his neighbor as himself. He took up his cross and he did it this day as we're supposed to do that daily. Remember last week's lesson? You can see that this good Samaritan did exactly what Jesus said. He denied himself and he took up his cross. Now, I don't know how much money this Samaritan had, but I do know what a denarii was. It was, two, it was a day's wages. And, and so this man gave the equivalent of two days wages to care for this man and was prepared to pay more than that if necessary to the innkeeper. Now today, in today's currency, that would be somewhere between uh, $64 and $150 to $200, depending on what your wage was, but a significant amount of money. Again, it was denying self, taking away money that you could spend on yourself and putting it into the care of a perfect stranger, uh, someone that you'd never met before, but someone that had a need, taking two days wages and just casting that for the care of your neighbor. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Now Jesus had contrasted the difference between the priest and the Levite and a Samaritan. And this lawyer who had asked him the question, who is my neighbor, couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan was the one who showed the mercy and really was the neighbor to the man that fell amongst the robbers. He could only say the one who showed mercy. He couldn't use the word Samaritan, even though Jesus had used that to identify him. It's also interesting to me that as the lawyer had a chance to reflect on what Jesus had said, to see the answer to question number 10, do you think that the lawyer understood why Jesus told the parable and did it change his life? <laughs> well, I got to share with you from an evangelistic standpoint, many times we don't know the result of the seeds that we plant. Many times we share the gospel 
and someone is not ready to make a commitment to the gospel. It's easy to try to manipulate them into praying a simple prayer, but that's not what really salvation is about. It comes from a desire of the person to pray that prayer, to repent and turn from their sins, and to accept Christ. And so, as Jesus may never have seen this man again, this lawyer, this method of the, uh, this messenger who knew the law backwards and forwards, uh, he may never have seen him again to know if his bringing his attention to who his neighbor was and to whether or not he would fully understand what Jesus was trying to teach him by teaching this parable. He recognized that wasn't his responsibility. His responsibility was to point out to him that the law wouldn't get him into heaven. And that kind of answers our first uh, thought here. Why, why didn't Jesus just say, you've got to accept me, the Messiah, as your Savior by faith? Well, first of all, the lawyer certainly would have said that's blasphemous. You're saying that you're God because only God can forgive sins. And that would have shut down all of the thought that the lawyer might make as a result of this discussion that occurred. Sometimes we want to hit people over the head with the Bible. I can remember early in my life uh, as a married man, I opened the door and there were a couple of witnesses at the door. And they said, if you were to die tonight, do you know you'd go to hell instead of to heaven? <laughs> well, I just shut the door. <laughs> Uh, I, was, I wasn't about to have somebody tell me I was going to hell, even though I knew I was going to heaven. Uh, it's sometimes the approach that we take makes a big difference in what the result is. And I'd love to know whether this lawyer reflected on all that Jesus said and that he later heard that Jesus had been crucified, put in a tomb, and then rose again, and then reflected back on this meeting with Jesus and said, ah, that's what he was talking about. If you love the Lord your God, you're going to love your neighbor. But that's not going to get you into heaven. It's the fact that he was the Messiah and that he rose from the dead to prove that he had the power over death. So we don't know the outcome of this story. Question number 10, we don't know. We don't know if it changed his life or not. Jesus didn't go on and say anything more. What is a parable? Well, it's a short story that has a moral to it, uh, of certain purpose that it's told. It's a little different than an allegory, a little different than a fable in the fact that it's short and it has a moral truth and it deals with humans instead of uh, uh, objects like trees and dogs and cats and things like that. Uh, but it has a moral to it, a central teaching to it. And here Jesus wanted to make sure that this lawyer knew that works would never get you into heaven. You couldn't love God enough and you couldn't love your neighbors enough to get into heaven. You see, good works is an outward evidence of an inner change. The inner change has to happen first and then the actions follow. That's probably why we're so divided today as Americans. There are so many that aren't Christians. There's no interchange. Therefore, there's no outward action. Social injustice, discrimination, prejudice, bias, on both sides, comes from not having an interchange. When an interchange comes about, there's a difference in the way we treat one another, respect one another, and understand one another. Do I think it really makes a lot of difference that we're going to have to change the name of Potato Man <laughs> to get away from the term man because there's discrimination between men and women? Do I think that whether or not uh, a cartoon character is colored yellow because he's a Chinese man is an affront to a Chinese man? After all, he is yellow and I am white. And if you depict me as a heavy man, I am a heavy man. I may not like to think that I'm overweight, 
but I am. And I'm not offended when somebody draws me that way because I know that I am overweight. You see, offenses come easily when we're not changed inside. Offenses come easily when we don't have an inner change that changes our outward activities and changes our outward active, our attitude towards others. I think this is a great lesson for us to think about who is our neighbor. It's anyone and everyone. Are some easier to love than others? Absolutely. Do we absolutely agree with everything that everybody else says? Absolutely not. Political correctness is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us to love one another. To tell them, yes. To force them, no, we can't. Uh, to look down on them because they're not Christians, no. Uh, to be a person that shows prejudice and bias and social injustice, absolutely not, just the contrary. Everybody's our neighbor and we're supposed to love them. So as we look at this lesson, we've answered almost all of the questions, except perhaps the one that I asked about. How many parables are there that Jesus told? Parables was a common teaching method of Jesus. And it depends whether you count parables told in the, each of the Gospels, or whether you just count the parables that are not duplicated but it's safe to say that there are over 36 parables that Jesus told, individual, unique parables. A lot of those were duplicated in the parallel passages of the Synoptic Gospels. I, th I think there's something like 25 total uh, that are told in more than one Gospel. Uh, so some people might say as many as 46. Some might even say 50 or 60 because they take some of the things that were taught in John uh, and say that that's a parable even though the word parable is not used. It doesn't matter to me. It was a common teaching of Jesus to take a short story and to teach a moral truth. It's a very effective way of teaching. Notice also how Jesus used questions. And we've been using questions now for a couple of weeks in our Sunday school lessons to get you thinking, to get you looking and digging. Now, here's the most important question I could possibly ask you about application of this lesson today. Suppose you were out in the country and it was a dark night, but your headlights shone on a person who was laying on the side of the road, bloody and not moving. What would you do? Your cell phone doesn't have any signal, so you can't cop out by saying, I'd call an ambulance or call the police. There you are on a country road, no cell phone service, and a body's laying there covered in blood and not moving. What would you do? Would you be a priest, a Levite, or would you be a good Samaritan? You say, well, pastor, things are different today. After all, it might be a setup. That person may be just laying there so that he can take advantage of me when I stop to help him. Yes, there was danger in the day of Jesus as well. The Samaritan didn't know that the robbers weren't still there and hiding behind rocks, just waiting for him to come and help. Or that even the man laying on the ground that was beaten and the clothes had been stripped from him wasn't part of the ploy. It's difficult. We have to deny ourselves. We have to take up our cross. Now, I've just jotted down some things that I said to myself that I would do if I found that kind of a scene. A body laying by the side of the road, bloody and not moving. The first thing I would do is observe it. I'd slow down. I'd take a good look. I'd look around and consider the risks and quickly decide whether or not I needed to get out, first aid kit, rags, whatever I might have in the car to help this person. I would do whatever I could with my time and my talent. I'd be careful not to move him because I know that moving him might cause even further injury. Since there's no cell signal, I'd try to make him as comfortable as I possibly could and as quickly as I could get to some place where I could call for additional help. 
But, you know, one of the things that I learned a number of years ago from a fine Christian person was that every time I heard an ambulance, a siren of a fire truck or a police car, that although I couldn't go respond to every one of those sirens, whether it's fire, police matter, or, or whether it's an ambulance taking someone to a hospital, the one thing that I could do was pray. I, I could pray for those that were involved in meeting that need as well as for the one that was in that need. And that's a good thing to do because you see, everybody's our neighbor. Those policemen, those ambulance drivers, those firemen, they're our neighbors. Those people in the burning buildings, uh, those people that are laying by the side of the road, uh, those people that need the assistance of emergency vehicles, they're our neighbors too. And at the very least, we can pray for them. A woman on the road by herself, looking at a body on the road, might not feel, and might not be led of God to stop and to help but they could pray and get to some place where they could get help as quickly as they possibly could. It's still denying self and taking up your cross and following him. Who's your neighbor? And are you loving him as God commanded us to love not only himself, but to love our neighbor? God bless you and have a great day. Try to go to church if you possibly can. If you can't, be sure to get the vaccine so that quickly you can get back to the normal routine of going to church. You have a great day, and I pray that uh, many people will make decisions for Christ today in church.